So today on No Nonsense, the energy landscape and the net zero agenda, that's kind of where we're going to start. There are two views of the world, of course, as you well know. One is that the federal government is pushing an aggressive emissions reduction strategy, which could devastate the Canadian economy and threaten our way of life. And then the other view is this is an existential crisis that demands that we take dramatic action if we're going to save the planet. And that too is going to radically alter our economy and our way of life. So always lots of issues on the table. And we've um, we've gone to a really interesting source today. Brian Zinchuk, so he's a journalist. He's the editor and owner of Pipeline Online, a website, really on Saskatchewan's energy news, founded in 2021. But he has a global take on the issue. And of course, he's here in Saskatchewan. He's worked in the patch. So he actually understands a little bit more than your average journalist about what is going on. And we'll have some questions about the status of pipelines and other activity. Brian, great to meet you in person. Welcome. Good day. I I listen to you regularly on the radio. So this is uh, this is great. Now we get to see you in person. We get to talk. Yeah, and I guess as I was saying before here, I grew up watching you on uh, the journal. So (laughs) I guess turnabout's fair play. Yeah, turnabout's fair play. Okay, let's start with two stories that kind of grabbed me this week. So the first one was, and I was really sort of surprised by this, demand for gasoline. These are American. This is American number, uh, not Canadian. But demand for gasoline has hit a 20-year low per capita. Fuel use will plunge to the lowest level in two decades. This is a 15% drop from 2004. And the question is why? High gas prices, inflation, fuel efficiency, EVs. So I'm thinking about all of those. And then the next story I hear is that nobody's buying EVs anymore. Sales are dwindling. Production is being halted. So what's going on? Well, I can give you a personal example of why that's happening. So mm-hmm. I have a, a number of older vehicles in our family. I've got two yeah. kids or teenagers. So I bought a 2004 Buick Rainier with a 4.2 liter uh, straight six engine. Yeah, uh, I bought it back in 2008 and it was my primary vehicle for several years. I kept it for the kids. Yeah, that was a 2004 version. I then bought a much larger uh, 2011 Exp- Ford Expedition, which is the biggest SUV you can buy. Right. But better fuel economy than the 2004 uh, midsize SUV. Right. So then just recently, last year, my wife bought a 2019 Expedition, which is again, the biggest SUV you can buy. And it gets better fuel economy than, <laughs> than the 2011 Expedition or the 2004. So we're actually getting better fuel economy with a 6,000 pound SUV than any vehicle I've had except for a 98 Geo Metro. So <laughs> the okay. reality is, is that it's actually phenomenal. And these vehicles, that my, as my wife's SUV has 395 horsepower, which is 95 more horsepower than a top end Camaro in the nineties. Yeah. And it gets better fuel economy. It has everything to do with technological change, uh, variable yeah. displacement and stuff like that. Makes these engines extremely complex. But when every vehicle you make is getting remarkable fuel economy, I mean, can you imagine you can buy pickup trucks now that get in excess of thirty miles per gallon? No, this is like we used to call all these things the gas guzzlers. But your point is, they're not. They, I mean, they're never going to be the same as the smaller vehicles and whatnot. But the reality is, Ford doesn't even make cars anymore except for the the Mustang. Uh, yeah. you know, everyone's driving some form of SUV or pickup truck in rural Saskatchewan. I've done stories for years ago where I talked to every dealer in Southeast Saskatchewan, every single one of them, 80 to 90% of their sales are pickup trucks. And that we'll get into the EV part of that because yeah. it's a very important relationship I, there. Uh, I, w- I want to get into that because, you know, I work in Ottawa and then I come home and spend time in Saskatchewan. We're having a pretty nice uh, November so far. Usually it's it's pretty darn cold at this point. And, and the people who live in urban centers say, get an EV. And I go, okay, I'm three hours from the airport and there's one charging station and it's 40 below regularly. Don't think that's going to work out. 
where are we on on that move when we hear these statistics that in fact sales are down and production is down so that actually ties into a lot of these other discussions it's it's fundamental uh when i first launched pipeline online after 12 years mm-hmm. of pipeline news pipeline news was a, a newspaper for sketch and soil patch but it died yeah. like all newspapers are dying <laughs> yeah you bet and uh I expected that I would be writing mostly about pump jacks and drilling rigs because that was mostly what I did. And now I'm writing a lot about the energy transition and the EVs is a huge function of that. So it, you can't get around fundamental physics and chemistry. And you, uh, when you have an EV, you need to be able to charge it. Well, mm-hmm. a pickup truck weighs a lot more than a car, so it needs a lot more energy to charge it. And remember I said 90% of sales in rural Saskatchewan are pickup trucks? Yep. Well, there was an article in a website called Design News a couple of years ago. They interviewed the chief designer of the Ford F-150 Lightning, which was supposed to change the world for right. And it turns out that you need uh, an 80-amp charger on a 100-amp circuit at home in order to have enough power to uh, charge that pickup truck from 15% to 100% overnight. If you'd use a, a standard 30 amp charger, it's used for most yep. EV cars that you might see in Ottawa. Uh, it would take 15 to 19 hours to charge overnight. So there are not enough hours in the day to charge right. a pickup truck on a 30 amp charger. Now, a lot of these are numbers. People don't like whatever. It yep. doesn't mean anything. But your but ordinary plug in that you've got out there that you maybe plug in to keep your, you know, your engine warm in the winter. I just plugged that into my, uh, you know, outside plug-in. But if I had a big Wacken EV or the Ford Lightning, that that's not going to work. Or so, it's going to take let, 20 hours. in perspective. A typical house built before 2000 had 100 amps for the whole house. Yeah. That's your dryer, your microwave, your stove, your daughter's uh, uh, hair dryer, all running at the same time. <laughs> right. That pickup truck needs the equivalent of the power of a pre of a 1980s house just for that pickup truck. So every Ford F-150 that they sell, SAS Power, Manitoba Hydro, or whoever has to produce the power generation, the equivalent of a full house, the transmission to get it there, and the distribution to get it to your thing. And do it for every uh, place on the block. So I did a presentation to the building and owners and managers association to Saskatoon or of Saskatchewan a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And I explained how if you have, let's say, a 200 unit condo and everyone has to have, they currently have a 15 amp tr- uh, plug in for your uh, block heater, like you say. Yeah. Well, every one of those has to be a minimum of a 30 amp. And for every pickup truck, you need an 80 amp. So you all of a sudden have to go to SAS Power and say, well, I need enough power for 80 or for 200 units for my right. condo. And then the guy across the street, well, he's got 350 units. Is SAS Power going to have enough power for all this? And are they going to have the grid capacity to do it? Because we're talking like power lines like that. Right. And th- that goes into the power generation, distribution, and the clean electricity standards, the clean fuel standards. It's a huge, huge thing. I guess the issue is really, Brian, it, it, it's just, and so many people have said this, that you know we're on the path to transition and being more uh, conscious and concerned about the environment and about emissions, but we're just not there yet. We're still going to be driving gasoline powered combustion engine vehicles for a while yet because we don't have the infrastructure in place to do anything else. So one of the things I've found has been driving a lot of the stories I'm writing is this fundamental question. Why are we throwing away what we absolutely know works and has worked for generations for what we know absolutely does not work? So, for instance, uh, there are six or six miles from my house. There's two coal fired power plants and they have powered Saskatchewan for my entire life, your entire life. Mm-hmm. Right? And we know they work. Now, occasionally one unit might go down for whatever reason. They got to fix it or something broke. But the whole fleet never goes down. Because if they did, we'd be freezing in the dark and dying. Yeah, for sure. SAS Power does not put out detailed information. In fact, they hardly put out any information until after nine months of me badgering them in stories. They finally put up a very limited thing on their webpage saying this is where we got our power two days ago. 
But the Alberta Electric System Operator puts out daily information by the minute for every facility. And I found that about two years when I started writing about it. And I've done that story at least 24 times. Where uh, in Alberta, the entire fleet of wind, which two years ago was 2,700 megawatts. Today, it's 4,200 or 4,500 megawatts. The whole fleet, hundreds of turbines costing multiple billions of dollars, goes to three megawatts two megawatts so you can get a large caterpillar generator that runs on diesel that had as at times in the last year produced more power than the entire fleet of all the wind turbines from pincher creek to oyen uh from Tabor up to uh, vulcan so how do we trust that yeah, well, I mean, we've heard the premier and others say, I mean, the trouble is with that and 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 wind and solar are still a pretty small percentage of the source, right? It, not really, not in Alberta. No. So in Alberta, uh, I mean, some days they have some days they have a fair bit. Like uh, two days ago, Alberta's wind was producing 80 percent, which is the highest I've ever seen. They were producing. 3200 megawatts which was yeah the last couple of days we could have done it here too in saskatchewan <laughs> wind was crazy the problem is it's not when it works I, I use the example of a bridge a bridge is great when it works you don't think about it, it's there but the day that bridge falls into the river such as when wind goes to zero or the sun goes down every single night well mm -hmm. then you have a problem so what what percentage, um, I mean, you can't really know in Saskatchewan, you sort of can know in Alberta how much we have transited to wind and solar, whether it's reliable or not, but but there is a percentage it provides. So there's very, there's next to no grid scale solar in Saskatchewan. Currently there's 30 yeah. megawatts, which averages production of five or six megawatts on a good day, sometimes as little as three average for 24 hours. We have 617 megawatts of uh, of wind, which on an average day produces 130 to 250, sometimes 400, but sometimes yeah. zero. Uh, the entire grid, if every if the wind was blowing, the sun was shining, if every dam was full and every plant was going, we could theoretically produce 5,400 megawatts in Saskatchewan. But the reality is the highest we've ever done was 3,910. So SAS power... CEO and other people say we have a 5,400 megawatt grid. That's really not the case because we've never done that. But uh, we have produced 3,900 megawatts. Okay. And which, by the way, that is that that total capacity is less than the wind and solar Alberta has for its grid. So Alberta has built more than Saskatchewan already yeah. has for its whole thing. And the other thing is SAS Power wants to build they want to add an additional 3,000 megawatts of wind and solar by 2035. 700 has already been let out. They're building some of it near Kipling right now. Okay, so because everybody's listening in different places, um, I, I want to broaden it out a, a little bit if I can. So I want to come back to this EV question before we move on to other things like the carbon tax and the clean fuel standard and all the rest of it. So like, let's be basic here. Batteries aren't the they don't make electricity to run these evs they're kind of like a storage unit right exactly they're like a tank they're like a fuel tank or a jerry can yeah. they're not the actual energy themselves right so they have to have they have to be fueled they have to be filled with this energy that comes from some other source whether it's coal or natural gas or diesel or or hydroelectricity so when we talk about zero emissions vehicles, they're not actually zero emission vehicles because the batteries being is is maybe not emitting, but the battery is being filled up with energy that is still emitting. Oh, absolutely. So uh, in Saskatchewan and Alberta, uh, mm -hmm. on any given day in Saskatchewan, uh, coal and natural gas combine to an at, usually up to 84%, sometimes down to 70, but as high as 87% coal and natural gas. Okay. In Alberta, uh, it can be up to 94% mostly natural gas for a bit of coal because they, they're down to one coal plant, which will shut down soon within weeks. Uh, 
So yeah, you're right. It's not zero emissions there. In other uh, provinces such as Manitoba, such as yeah. Ontario, or uh, sorry, Quebec and uh, BC, almost all their power is hydro. And yes, that is zero emissions. But uh, you're right. In jurisdictions as well as Atlantic Canada, like uh, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, they st- they burn a lot of uh, uh, petroleum coke, for instance, in some right. places, or coal, and and you're not zero emissions on that. One of the other things I want to point out about that, because this is a, a good point, we keep talking about the hydrogen economy, and mm-hmm. every politician, that's the newest thing, the hydrogen economy, this, that, and everything. We have, across the entire country, according to the federal government website, six retail fueling stations for hydrogen. Uh, mm-hmm. One's in Victoria, three in the lower mainland, one's in Mississauga, and one's in Quebec City. So it's a real long drive from the lower mainland to Mississauga. Right. Uh, so the reality is, the uh, hydrogen economy at this point is unicorn farts. We'd have to build out an entire new infrastructure across the entire country. We already have that with electricity. We can power it anywhere you can put a plug in. We just need a lot more power. And this yeah. comes uh, to what the federal government, they first started putting some serious numbers on this in the, fe- in the budget of 23. They said, we need to increase the size of the electrical grid by a factor of two to three times. And then the clean electricity regulations narrowed that down to a factor of 2.5. So the column I'm going to be putting out here soon here makes an example of, okay, let's take some other infrastructure and multiply it by two and a half. Let's do roads. If we're going to increase the size of roads across the entire country, we're, right now they're twinning the highway south of Regina, and it's going to take them maybe a decade to get 100 kilometers. Twin every single road, every single highway, freeway, street, laneway in the entire country at the same time over the next 26 years, one month, and 15 days. How much expense is that? They might say, well, that's absolutely ridiculous. There's no way you can even think of twinning, you know, not only streets, but alleyways. Who right. would ever think of that? But that is precisely what increasing the electrical grid by a factor of 2.5 means not just that's just factor of two 2.5 means not add two lanes but add a third lane and that's what you have that's an interesting analogy so people can visualize what it would mean to you know double triple capacity and and where would all these uh you know lines run where would all these pipes run and and how would we do that and it's not, you know, a lot of people seem to think, well, we'll just build more wind turbines or we're just going to build more solar panels or maybe we'll build some natural gas or build nuclear. That's a big thing. We're going to build a lot of nuclear. Yeah. Saskatchewan's going heavily down that path. That's great, but that's still only generation. You still have to get it to your pedestal in your backyard or to the power yeah. pole in your farm. And that means effectively everything has to double. So between my family here, we drive uh, trucks. We've got four trucks in the driveway. Are we going to have, if we charge them all at the same time, we need the equivalent of five houses of power here. Obviously, we're not going to do that. Right. But on my street, there is not one house that doesn't have a pickup truck. Right. And, the, and and here's the thing you touched on for weather. Okay. What most people don't realize is that, you know, when you plug in, you have a car, you, you want to warm it up for the morning, you plug in for block heater for gasoline and warms up for half an hour or whatever, or maybe yep. run it all night, but then he's fired up and go. Electric batteries in EVs must be kept warm all the time because if they don't, they draw the power from within the battery to keep that battery warm and they will do so until they run the battery flat. So that means that in wintertime, that EV, if it's not plugged in, it's drawing down its own battery the whole time it's like your fuel gauge so it needs a heated garage to live in as well exactly so if otherwise that means every ev has to be either in a heated or at least a garage doesn't necessarily have to be heated, but it has to be right, right. kept warmer or it has to be plugged in so it can heat itself because if that battery ever freezes solid in minus 30 it's basically done so it's a twenty thousand dollar expense oh sorry you need a new battery uh hope it doesn't happen again or 40,000, 20 seems cheap for some of the replacement costs. Precisely. Yeah. So the, and, you know, that is a huge factor. So that means, you know, those examples I said of condos. Right. Every car that's an EV in the wintertime needs to be plugged in for at least enough power for maintenance heat, never mind charging it. 
So you know this, and and lots of people know this. So why do why have we heard? And and I'm thinking, you know, the COP meeting in Dubai is coming up at the end of the month, and every politician will go, and there'll be all sorts of discussions about, uh, you know, her speeding up the process to uh, net zero, and we have to hurry. Um, but but if if we don't have the replacements in place, I don't know how we're supposed to do that. And just saying to people, you know, the end is nigh, uh, this is an existential crisis, does not help if we have no alternative. So I think uh, your statement there that I know this, I think that in the, within the media, at least from the Saskatchewan media, I am the only person in Saskatchewan media reporting on this. Everyone else has bought hook, line, and sinker, the nihilistic argument that it's the end of the world and that if we don't do this for the next amount of time, that we're all going to die. Uh, the reality is the climate has always been changing. The natural state of Canada for 80,000 of the last 100,000 years has been to be an iceberg that have a, a mile to two miles of ice covering it. And only 20% of the time in the last two and a half million years have we even 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 live in Estevan or Wadena or Saskatoon yeah. because it was covered in ice? So the climate has always been changing, and you know this idea that all of a sudden uh, we're going to and we're going to die. No, we're not. If if if, the, if by chance the uh, oceans did rise by ten feet, we just move. You know, we <laughs> have the ability to do that. Well, that's the that I that's the question I was getting to because in the first place you'll just be dismissed instantly as a climate denier because you're right the mainstream thinking is really that the end the end is nigh, but to me and and I know we're doing some of it but when we know the answer is not available tomorrow that the alternative is not available tomorrow morning it may be at some point but it certainly isn't by 2025 or probably not by 2030 so how much focus do we need or more focus do we need on mitigation and adaptation and getting ready uh for the change as opposed to just saying it has to happen tomorrow we're not going to sell any more combustion engine cars you won't be able to buy them even though you won't be able to run your EV. So, you know, what you're touching on here is actually, this is what's happening in the past few months. And this is where the dam starts to break. It's all about the carbon tax. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I, I live and breathe this stuff. I'm a political animal. <laughs> and I know you are. You are, you're a, you're a energy geek. You well, are I, I met my wife through youth parliament. So, I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, I, I, but the, here's the thing. I report on this on a daily basis, and I never clued in until a year ago when Premier Scott Moe put out what he called his drawing the line white paper. Yeah. How there was nine different policies in the, and a clean electricity standard being the 10th one, which was not factored into that. That when you add the carbon tax and then the clean fuel standard and then the output based pricing system, which is a third form of carbon tax for industrial uh, people, and then the nitrogen fertilizer, and you add all these together. A lot of people might have thought that really the only thing the Liberal government had accomplished under Trudeau was legalizing marijuana. But the reality is all these other things have happened that most people didn't put together that when you add it up it is the fundamental total transformation of our society and how we eat, how we produce food, how we heat ourselves. And the absolute foundation of that is the federal carbon tax, because the entire purpose of a carbon tax is just like uh, tobacco taxes and just right. like alcohol taxes, whatever you don't like, you keep increasing the taxes until it goes away. So the carbon tax applies to everything that we heat, everything that moves, and uh, everything that we need to keep uh, keep warm or produce. So this, are we going to get rid of all the stuff we want to eat or heat or move? This is the difference. If you want to jack the taxes on cigarettes and and alcohol and the sin, the so called sin taxes, I get that. Those are optional things, um, and people can make those decisions. But you know, it, heating your home or driving your vehicle, I don't have a subway to get onto. We don't have bus service in Saskatchewan. I don't have Uber. There are there aren't other alternatives. I need to drive to buy food. Uh, farmers need to drive to ship their uh, canola or wheat in order that we can make food. And then that food, this is 
how um, how the world actually works in places outside downtown cores in our urban centers. Well, and that's what's happening with the carbon tax. So you have people in Springdale, Newfoundland who are using fuel oil because, oh, guess what? Building a natural gas pipeline to your house on the rock yeah. where every pipeline has to be blasted, that doesn't work very well. So that's why they use fuel oil because they didn't have really any other options. Uh, what do you do in that situation? There isn't an easy replacement. All of a sudden, we it, it, two years ago, no one talked about heat pumps at all. Now the right. federal government has said, oh, we're all just going to magically use heat pumps. It's a technology that's going to save everything, except that they really don't work well in cold weather. Not that we ever get cold weather in Canada, especially in the prairies. <laughs> I will say, I did some looking into this, and I was thinking, like, what's the coldest it gets in Newfoundland? So I looked up Gander, and I looked up uh, Springdale, and I looked up right. uh, Sydney, Nova Scotia. And a lot of those places, the coldest day in the last two years is minus 26. Mm-hmm. That is within the operational range of the top and highest uh, heat ranges. But on the prairies, I have personally seen on my dad's farm, the thing say minus 44. So what are we supposed to do for that extra 20 degrees that that heat pump can't put out? Oh, well, they they say they have resistive, which means electrical heating. Well, that means they're drawing more power from the grid. The same one that's also charging your pickup truck outside. So. The uh, power lines that were built for, you know, having one light bulb in your house, in every room in a house that now has 100 different electrical things, and now charging your EV, now has to charge a house or heat the house. The grid is not there to do it. And the example you're using about, well, you know, the technology isn't prepared yet. And that's what happened. Uh, Atlantic Canada said when they got slapped with the carbon tax, well, holy, holy uh, jeepers there by, I got to pay you all this extra tax on them. <laughs> And I don't have a replacement. What do I do? People you know, are literally in a choice of, do I eat or do I freeze? And this is my dad, you know, uh, when he was, you know, kind of semi-retired, he was in a tough spot financially and he had fuel oil heat. And yeah. this was before the carbon tax, long before the carbon tax. And he was in a tough spot and we, he actually ended up getting a grant to replace it with, with propane. He was at the point where, do I heat the house or do I buy food? Couldn't do both. And this is what's happening across Atlantic Canada. So when you take that fundamental thing, to pro- and this is the first time the Trudeau government has blinked on us, where you say, oh, well, you know, it's not really fundamentally important. Well, then the whole argument of that whole nine different programs, 10 with clean, clean electricity regulations, goes out the window. Because, yeah, yeah. oh, you aren't really serious about it? Well, then were you serious about any of it? Well, this is why I think everybody is so puzzled, because this is all that people have been saying is, you know, I live in a community of farmers and and they're paying sometimes seven, eight hundred dollars a day, sometimes a thousand dollars a day. Like we've got 10 section farms around here. That's a lot of land um, and a lot of equipment to run, paying thousands of dollars a day just in the carbon tax, never mind what it is costing them to actually engage in the grain drying or the movement of of the field. So one, I, I think that's where everybody was puzzled. And, and he went to Atlantic Canada, the prime minister, and said, okay, I realize the carbon tax is hurting you. So we're going to put some mitigation measures in place and we're going to, we're, we're going to make it hurt, hurt less. And then he's surprised that everybody in the rest of the country says, yes, but it's hurting us too. Well, and regarding that, okay, the entire purpose of a carbon tax was to make it hurt. That's why he brought it in. And I'm glad you brought up the farming thing. Uh, In Southeast Saskatchewan here, we got, I know a number of people have 15,000 acre farms, like hundred quarters of land. It's huge. And the amount you're saying is absolutely right. So, and what are they producing? They're producing food. But here's an interesting thing. And this is a difficult position for the provincial government of Saskatchewan because they're talking about, oh, we've got multiple billions of dollars of canola crushing plants being built. Mm. My mom is the closest neighbor to the two in York, and she's literally right across the tracks. You can throw a rock and hit them. They were going to build one here uh, at Northgate. That one failed, but they're going to do some uh, in Regina. Uh, Cargill's doing one, uh, AGT Foods and uh, Ferry Co-op. Yep. And right now, and my numbers are rough on this, okay, because I'm, I'm not an ag reporter, about one third of Saskatchewan crop production is in canola. 
And that's the most you yeah. can do because you need a one to three crop rotation. Otherwise, you get uh, disease yeah. problems. So yeah. I talked to the guy who's responsible for building one of these, the one that didn't work out. I said, these can all crush plants. They're not all because everyone decided they want, I can't believe it's not butter or base cell. I said, no, it's entirely driven by the clean fuel standard. So the clean fuel standard is the second carbon tax of three. Right. And it, it's basically, the, its stated purpose is to decarbonize carbon-based fuel, which is like saying we're going to take the H2O out of water. <laughs> if that sounds ridiculous, it's because it absolutely is ridiculous. So the idea is that there will be ever-increasing proportion of uh, biological fuel, biofuels being put into our both our gasoline and our diesel stream to displace the fossil fuels. And the uh, so more ethanol, they're actually going to put more ethanol, which comes from corn by and large, right? Yeah, or and, we, uh, yeah, or we, I mean, but stuff that we generally eat, we're now going to put in our gasoline to try and reduce emissions, but we're also taking away the actual food source, right? So, so remember, one third of Saskatchewan is uh, canola. Well, yeah. in talking to this gentleman, roughly half of that's going to go for these this fuel production. So that means you do the math, you're looking at, you have to talk to Canola Council, I could be off on this a little bit, roughly one-sixth of Saskatchewan farmland will be used to grow fuel, not food. Now, when the world is, everyone's fed, fundamentally, okay, everyone's fed, there's no one hungry. I can but get, that's get that. not where we're at. But that's not where we're at. Uh, my daughter goes to the grocery store and... You know, she's got a new job as a heavy duty mechanic apprentice in, in the oil patch. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's getting paid. Her her starting wage was better than my finishing wage as a newspaper editor. Right. right. But she's getting paid well. And she's going to the grocery store. And she's like, Dad, I can't afford to buy groceries. So one of the things that's driving that yeah, is yeah. the biofuel stuff. We're taking farmland out of food production. We're putting it into fuel production. Why? Again, going back to why are we taking away what we know works? for what we know doesn't work. So we just on that, so carbon tax and then the clean fuel standard that came in uh, this year, and then this new clean electricity standard, what's what's that one going to mean? So that is, that is the 800 pound gorilla. Everything else is nothing compared to the clean electricity regulations because it says that you have to get rid by 2035 you have to shut down all fossil fuel power production, if, if, except for, we'll let you run it for 18 days a year for when the wind doesn't blow. In emergencies. In yeah. emergencies. Who's yeah. going to build or keep or maintain a natural gas power plant to run it 18 days a year for 120, 124th of the year? They're not going to do it. Okay. Yeah. So the in Saskatchewan, as I said, up to 87% of our power comes from fossil fuel. So not only do we have to increase by a factor of two and a half, but we have to replace the, the what we have already. So we basically have to rebuild it and then multiply it by two and a half. In Alberta, up to 94% is natural, mostly natural gas with a little bit of coal. So they have to replace all of that, basically their entire grid uh, for generation, and then double it by two and a half and do it in 26 years. And actually, for a clean fuel standard, sorry, it's 11 years, one month, and 15 days. Right, and I keep right. saying that because I want to point out how ridiculous it is that these timelines are so damn close that you can measure it by days. Well, and this is the other problem that we've got and, and the industry and farmers and all sorts of people that aren't a direct vested interest have said, because we, we talk about this all the time, there is so much bureaucracy, there is so much uh, paperwork to the approval process to get the new um, sources built, that, that that makes it doubly, triply, whatever the number is, more difficult to meet these goals, these the, the 2030s, the 2035s, because you can't even get approvals for the processes. So perfect example, about six miles west of my house is the most likely location they're going to build multiple nuclear reactors just off okay. Rafferty Dam. Uh, they're going to use it to tie into some of the existing grid infrastructure here already. So Right now, SAS Power has four large coal units and a number of small ones, 300 megawatts each. That's our standard size, 300 megawatts. So that's what they call a small modular reactor, 300 megawatt range. So they're going to build 
First they said four, and then they, um, the minister mentioned, well, we could up, build up to eight in Saskatchewan, not necessarily here, but mm-hmm. elsewhere. And then that number's in flux. The premier told me, well, we could be able to build some thousand megawatt reactors. And that has to do with the Westinghouse uh, purchase from Cameco. But anyhow, let's get, let's focus on what they're going to do in Estevan. So they've had open houses here a couple of weeks ago, and they had some a few months ago. And the regulatory stuff is taking years and years and years before they even scratch dirt. As soon as they think they can scratch dirt, right now it's 2023, it's 2030. So, and if we do that, if nothing uh, gums up the works, we'll start scratching dirt in 2030. We'll have it online, 2034, 2035. We'll have one 300 megawatt reactor online by that point. That would replace one coal unit. Remember I said we had four major right. ones? That only replaces one. And then we build another one every couple of years after every three years or thereabouts. Here's the reality. The Regina refinery, which is a mid-sized refinery, produces almost all the uh, transportation fuel and fuel oil used in Saskatchewan, a bit of Alberta, a bit of Manitoba. But for argument's sake, let's say Saskatchewan. Its processing capability is about 130,000 barrels a day. So remember I said SAS Power's maximum output ever was 3,900 megawatts? So I did a little bit of math. And then because I flunked out of engineering, I asked a bunch of engineers who actually been worked, who've retired to check my numbers. So that's about a half dozen. They all came back very similar. The energy equivalent of that 130,000 barrels a day is equal to somewhere between 8,600 and 9,100 megawatts. So if we get rid of all the diesel fuel and gasoline that our farmers use, that our truckers use, that our cars use, uh, that our fuel oil is used on some farms, we get rid of all of that and we replace it with electricity, that's the equivalent of around 30 small modular reactors. Now, you could say, well, electric vehicles are more efficient than gasoline vehicles. There's an argument to be said for that. So let's be generous and say you only need half as many. Well, that's 15 reactors to replace the one. And we're building four or maybe eight. Yeah, but we're starting with one. Yeah. So that's 15 Very reactors nice. to replace the one refinery because we're getting rid of gas. Remember, we're not going to be able to buy electric or get, sorry, gasoline or diesel vehicle yep. 11 years. Well, we got we have to have that power. So if the federal government is really serious about this, they would dramatically reduce the uh, regulatory requirements for getting yep. nuclear plants built. It's really not rocket science. We we did it in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s right. in Ontario. There's nothing new to figure out. You go, is this a good place? Is, there, is uh, Do you have enough water? Is the ground stable enough? Is it not going to fall in? Is it not going to be in someone's immediate backyard? Okay, build the darn thing and build lots yeah. of them. And get the economies of scale of building, you know, literally reactors by the dozen. Because it doesn't matter how many wind turbines you build. I did a story this last year where the argument for wind is that if it's not blowing here, it's got to be blowing somewhere. So if we build enough turbines to spread them out, we connect them all and do provincial interconnects, we can pull power from somewhere. So on this one day, I think it was in May or April or August, I have to, or June, somewhere around there, there was no wind from Pincher Creek all the way through Saskatchewan to St. Leon, Manitoba, and all the way down to the Texas Panhandle, which is the Southwest Power Pool SAS Power is connecting to. There was no wind in 14 states and provinces at the same time. And some people say, well, that can never happen. I saw a thing on LinkedIn yesterday saying, oh, it's wind is always blowing somewhere. Well, no, it's not. Yeah. So the reality is stop spending money on wind. If you are serious about no emissions, if you're serious about making this actually work, throw every dollar you can into building reactors, build them at scale, yeah. pump them out like sausages, like Cruz Jeff said about nuclear missiles. Just build re- reactor after reactor after reactor. That is the only way you can do this. Well, in these small nuclear reactors that that all that are all the rage in terms of what people are talking about. I mean, they're also you can go and run local operations here and there, a mine to get potash out, or a, you know whatever it may be that we need. They don't have to be these giant venues that we see across Ontario. Well, okay, so. There's basically three scales there. 
And some people conflate the two of them. And that, that's what you're doing right now. Okay. So, correct so me, large, please. So large reactors are ones you see in Ontario. They're 600 megawatts to 1,000 megawatts. Okay. Yeah. Big, giant things. Bruce Power, Darlington. Yeah. Power. A small modular reactor is in the 300 megawatt range, which is the size of Shand Power Station in Estevan. Okay. Um, okay. How big is that? Like yeah, a 400 four megawatts. Okay. Okay. So it's, it's a good size power station. Got a whole okay. coal mine surrounding it. So that's the equivalent of the Shannon Power Station. It'd be similar in physical size as well. The ones you're talking about are micro reactors okay. where they sit, they can fit within the size of a few uh, sea cans. They basically, you know, the size of a high school shop area. Yeah. Yeah. That sort of when you can have a, uh, run a five megawatt thing where you can supply, say, a small re, uh, mine, like a uranium mine. So I may put a couple of these sea cans together as a pack and you have a small power plant those are more now being called micro reactors and they really okay. shouldn't be in the same discussion as the small okay ones. no that's a really important distinction and how long does it take to build those ones uh those are supposed to be you know they they haven't made any yet yeah uh those that's the path that uh, new brunswick is working on because they have a company there that wants to develop these the problem with that is and this no one ever talks about this part is that when you're going with nuclear, you have a security issue. Yeah. Because whether you have a 1,000 megawatt reactor or a 300 megawatt reactor or a 5 megawatt reactor, and it's running off of enriched uranium, you have the potential of a terrorism target. Yeah. So are you going to have an armed SWAT guarding uh, team guarding that facility in northern Saskatchewan out of mine? Now, most people say, well, ah, it's ridiculous. You don't need that. Well, I'm certain that we will have some sort of security here in Estevan if we build refi- these reactors. Right. And that's... Doesn't really in this day and age, I mean, you have to be realistic, right? So that's something that's never talked about. Oh, yeah, we'll put it in Seacan, we'll drive it out there to work. Okay, but do you have the uh, the armed forces to protect it? Are you going to do yeah. that? Okay, there just there's so many things. So I, I'm going to have to ask you to come back at some point. So a couple of quick questions just, just to wrap up. So the recent Supreme Court decision that said Ottawa's Bill 69, the so-called there'll never be another pipeline ever built again because the regulations are so complicated. The court said a lot of that just isn't right and it, it shouldn't apply. Is is that decision going to allow any of the things that we've been talking about today? This this adaptation, this transition to uh, to new low carbon energy is it going to speed that up? I don't know. I mean, the biggest thing on that where that would have an impact is on building reactors and on building transmission lines. Uh, you know, there's a lot of NIMBY. Not in my backyard yeah. when it comes to yeah. transmission lines. Perfect example. Uh, Manitoba realized that their grid was at risk because their two main power lines from the north were side by each running between the two lakes. And they had a storm come and whack them, and they were in serious trouble. So they figured we better spread out the grid, build another power line that's called yeah. Bipole 3. And it could have gone down the east side of Lake Winnipeg and would have been, you know, basically a straight line, relatively short. And the cost was estimated about three or eight hundred million dollars, but the First Nations there said, "You can't cut down a tree on our First Nation right. to build this power line to keep the, this, the province lit." So instead of doing that, they went hooked all the way around the western side of Manitoba to close to Swan River and Dauphin, and went all the way around at a cost of two billion dollars to get to the same place because the First Nations said, "Thou shalt not build power lines on our land." Yeah. So what happens for all these other projects to double the grid across the entire country? Individuals, right. towns, First Nations. Municipalities, farmers, yeah. Oh, my God, you can't build a power line on my land. You know, well, that's going to be an issue. So will that will this impact assessment thing make it easier? That I don't know. On the pipeline thing, that as well as the fact that the federal government has and protests have made building pipelines so expensive. The cost yeah. of Trans Mountain went up by a factor of somewhere between four and six, a multiple of four to six times its original estimate. Uh, the uh, coastal gas link, which they finally completed, thank God, is up by a factor of two to three times its original price. So yeah. w- w- in 1999, 
I worked on a pipeline project called the Alliance Pipeline. It was basically the last major pipeline built in Canada that didn't have enormous protests. And it went from Fort St. John in Northeast British yeah. Columbia, all the way through Alberta, Saskatchewan, across the border to Southeast West Van, all the way to Chicago. And they built that sucker for $5 billion. <laughs> and we did it in 16 months. I have a friend who's working on, who worked with me on that project, who's now in senior management working in uh, uh, BC on Trans Mountain. And he's been working on it for five going on six years. It's a retirement project for him. The it's original just, Trans yeah. Mountain was built in 16 months with equipment from yeah, the 1950s yeah. that didn't even have hydraulics. So the federal government has made it so difficult with all these regulatory things and then the protests and the and the government, instead of saying, we're just going to build it, allowing protesters to sit there and shut down things. Uh, the uh, Coastal Gas Link had a huge amount of that. Yeah. The wet swim, uh uh, hereditary chiefs didn't want it even though they weren't elected and they've made it such that you would have to be a total idiot to spend money to build a major infrastructure project in this country now it's going to take 10 years of straightening things out for anyone to even think of doing it again yeah okay and my final question and i'm going to say a quick but uh, it's never quick the many people have declared because of the prime minister's actions in Atlantic Canada that the carbon tax for all intents and purposes is dead. Then you have the counter argument that no, it's not. He's vested so much in this that he he politically can't let that happen. And that the middle road might be lifting the retail carbon tax, but keeping the industrial carbon tax. So carbon tax on the big guys that are building the big projects, the energy energy producers, but take it off the farmer. What how where do you come down in that debate? Okay, so you take it off the farmer. Do you take it off the fisherman who's got to put uh, diesel in his boat? Do you take it off the logger who is producing the, the uh, lumber for the housing that's so expensive that we can't afford housing yeah. anymore? Do you take it off the uh, cement truck, uh, a ready mix guy who's got to put fuel in a cement thing to build the housing that you need? Where and the wind you, turbines. And the wind turbines. And a wind turbine, yeah. <laughs> Where do you draw that line? Oh, what about yeah. for the trucker uh, who is hauling uh, vegetables? My father-in-law used to haul vegetables from California. Yeah. Uh, do you? What about the airlines? I, got a, I took a picture the other day, bought some grapefruit. Grapefruit came from South Africa. Okay. How did it get here? Well, a plane flew from uh, from South Africa here, but when it fueled up in Canada, it paid carbon tax on the fuel in Canada to go back to South Africa. So where do you draw that line? This is yeah. the, whole, the uh, uh, Dutch boy pulls his finger out of a dike and the whole yeah. thing collapses. Yeah. No, that's a really, that's a really important point. Brian, this has really been very interesting. I'm glad you're, uh, I'm glad you're an energy geek. I'm glad there's somebody following this on a daily basis because it's so complicated for people, right? It's just very complicated to mean, to figure out whether we can get from point A to point B. Well, I'm the only person in Saskatchewan who's doing this and I'm, I'm not going anywhere. This is my plan for the next 15 <laughs> years. So uh, the website is pipelineonline.ca. Yeah, and uh, and a regular on the Gormley radio show. I mean, he's retiring soon, but uh, we, we hope you're still there. So it, it is really worth taking a look at this. So pipelineonline.ca, right? Yes. Okay. Saskatchewan's Energy News. Brian Zinchuk. Real pleasure to meet you and thank you. Thank you for your time and thank you for your insight. Thank you very much, Senator. We'll talk again very soon. So that is it for this edition of No Nonsense and we'll see you very soon again too.